Let me preface this talk, like the universe and everything. I'm going to preface this talk with, I don't know everything about particle physics. I'm not an expert in particle physics. However, I know enough in which I can say, um, there's some strange things here. <laughs> so what is particle physics about? Well, it's about what the world is made of, what the universe is made of, what holds the Earth together, what holds the universe together. So ultimately, what we're after by studying particle physics is we're after the answer to every question that any eight-year-old has ever asked. Me. Okay? And so, if you have questions, by the way, in the middle of the talk, don't hesitate to ask, because I'll stop. And we'll just, I'll just change what I'm doing to accommodate the time. Okay. Let's start from the beginning. Let's go back to 460 BC with Democritus. And Democritus believed, he was a reductionist. And what a reductionist is, is somebody who believes that you can break down everything into its constituent particles. You'll break it down far enough, eventually everything's going to be made out of the same stuff. And so he was the person who came up with the idea of atoms. And what atoms mean, or what the word atom means, is something that is indivisible. Okay? So then he came up with this idea and we waited. And waited. And waited. Until about 1900. <laughs> It took a while. So we had atoms. And then actually it was about 1880 um, when they discovered electrons. We knew that matter had electrons. Well, there's still something missing here if you start to think about it. Because if you look at a periodic table, you'll say there's matter with electrons. Whatever this stuff is and the electrons going around them, they didn't know that at the time. But there's this stuff, but we can start seeing patterns. If we put different elements together in different ways, we see that they have the same characteristics. And so the idea was that if they had, we could break them up based on characteristic, there must be something smaller that we can find, that we can look for, that will ultimately allow us to separate it and say why these elements line up the way they do on the periodic table. Okay? By the way, I want you to pay attention to that background as I go through the slides. I know it looks like sort of a fuzzy gray background, just keep your eye on it for a while. Okay. Well, the first experiment, well, when they had a periodic table, they said there must be something smaller. Let's start throwing things at matter. That's what physicists do. If it's not small enough, let's see if we can break it up. So let's throw an alpha particle at gold. And if we throw an alpha particle at gold, what we start to see is that there are these little spots in the gold foil over here, it actually looks gold, the little spots in the gold foil in which if the alpha particle hit them just so, the alpha particle would bounce back toward the source. Otherwise, it would just be deflected or it would pass straight through without being deflected at all. Well, that told them something about matter. What it tells them is that matter is mostly empty space. And every once in a while, you hit this really dense spot and there's a big collision. So now we've separated that atom not into just electrons and whatever else it is, but electrons and a nucleus. Okay? The obvious question is, is that all? So now we have a nucleus and electrons. Can we go any further? Well, of course we can. We just get a bigger gun. We shoot things faster and harder. And when we shoot things faster and harder, we start to see more structure, more things break apart. And as we started to study this, we saw the neutrons and the protons, they were in the nucleus. And then we had the electrons going around the nucleus, okay, in some fashion. We all know that they actually don't work, but in some fashion, the electrons on the outside. This was kind of interesting. This was the structure of the atom, the structure of all matter. The structure of everything in the universe at the time of about 1930. That's kind of impressive when you think. 1930, this is all we knew. It led to Max Born, who was a very famous physicist, to say, sort of July of 1930, I think that by the end of this year, we'll have discovered everything that physics has to offer. Okay? 
comes you, right? Well, of course not. What we do is we get a bigger gun. We start shooting things at nucleus, and they start to see some structure there. Well, what does that mean? What kind of structure could be neutrons and protons? Are they made up of other particles? Are they not fundamental? So around the late 30s, basically, there were a couple of theoreticians who got together, well, more than a couple, and they came up with the idea of quarks. Maybe matter is made up of these little tiny particles, protons and neutrons, are made up of these little tiny particles, and in such a way that we can break neutrons and protons apart and we can see them. And that would explain a lot of the structure they were seeing with their experiments. Make sense? I mean, if you're seeing structure, what do you do? Get a bigger gun. <laughs> so the theoreticians came in and they said, if there's structure, maybe this explains it. We had quarks. Well, remember, this is about 1936. It took them 30 more years before they actually discovered quarks, experimentally. That's a long time to be building a bigger gun, if you think about it. OK, there's Max Born, by the way. Looks very dapper. OK, modern structure of the atom. Let's zoom forward a little bit. Let me give you the, the big picture, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about some of the more details here. So the modern structure of the atom, based upon the experiments in the 1960s, the theories in the 1930s, that, that we have protons, they're made up of three quarks, up, up, down. We have neutrons, which are made of three quarks, down, down, up. And you're going, what? And then we have um, the electrons floating around outside. And so if this were to scale, and each of the protons or neutrons were about a centimeter in size, the quarks and the electron would be about the width of a human hair. And the size of the atom itself would be about 30 football games. So right there, it explains to you, wait a second, that's mostly empty space <coughs> in this picture. That's kind of incredible when you think about it. Now, let's go back to this up, up, down stuff and this down, down, up. What does that mean? Well, it just so happens that protons and neutrons, based upon the experiments, are basically, are always made up of three quarks. Always. Okay? Well, not all matter is made up of three quarks. There are other things like mesons, which are made up of two quarks. And I'll get to the difference between mesons and baryons, which are protons and neutrons. Are you getting sort of lost here? Okay. Oh, electrons are called leptons, by the way. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's look at the particle zoo. This is where everyone gets lost. There are about 200 particles. Okay. And what we knew, so you see 1900, we knew this. We have an electron. 1920, we got a proton, structure of the atom, there's a positron, a positron. This is the first evidence that we had something called antimatter. What is antimatter? Well, antimatter is made up of particles just like matter, except it has the opposite charge, the same amount of mass, and when matter and antimatter mix, boom, lots of energy is given off and the particles are destroyed. You're still paying attention to that background, right? Okay. And then all of a sudden, you see, we get the muons. This is the same time that the quark theory came up. Those muons are very, very important because muons are basically the same family as electrons. We have the mu particles, muons, and the tau particles. Okay. And then we get the pions and the kaons. Okay. And then, oh, it gets, wait a second. There's something missing. Now we got it. Now we have the quark, where we discover it, and then we start finding more of these quarks and all these other particles, the W and the Z particle. And you can see that this is hard stuff. How do I understand this? Well, I believe it was Enrico Fermi, who was asked by one of his graduate students at the time, I think it was Leon Letterman. He said, Leon goes, or Dr. Letterman, maybe Nobel laureate Letterman, Maybe I should refer to him as that. He goes, how do you remember these? And Enrico Fermi goes, son, if I could remember all this, I would have been a botanist. <laughs> okay? That's the idea. You don't need to remember it. All you need to know is an equation, right? 
So now let's look at the standard model. We know there are about 200 particles. Here's the picture I showed you earlier, right there. All the particles in here, we have all the quarks. Look at the quarks. Up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. There are six quarks. And because each particle has an antiparticle, there are six antiquarks. So there's the anti-top, the anti-up, the anti-down, the anti-charm, the anti-strange, the anti-top and anti-bottom. Okay? And look at the leptons. We see neutrinos in there. Now, wait, that's the first time I've mentioned neutrinos. What are neutrinos? Well, this is key, right? This is what this, this gathering is all about. It's neutrino. Well, neutrinos are basically massless particles that are neutral, that don't interact with matter very well. <coughs> this sounds like the perfect solution to any problem you might be having. <laughs> you, just, you make something up that cannot interact with anything, it cannot be measured, and therefore you've solved the problem, right? <laughs> so theoretically, at least, we know that these neutrinos should be generated in collisions. And in these collisions, the theory was that there was a neutrino for each one of the, the leptons that we wanted. The, elec the electron, the muon, and the tau particle. There should be a neutrino associated with, the, with each one of those. But up until this time, up until late 1950s, they had only discovered the electron neutrino. Which led to a whole bunch of problems, by the way, in astronomy. Because they were measuring neutrinos from the sun, and they were not getting the right number based on the theory. Okay. This is the picture in the background. If we look at this picture, basically this is a bubble chamber picture. What a bubble chamber is, is, is it has gas, very cold gas. And what happens is we put charged particles through the bubble chamber and it, interact, it interacts with the gas. And if you put a magnetic field there at the same time, the charged particles will move in circles. Okay, so they'll change direction. So the first thing we notice when we start looking at this is, well, I don't know about the first thing you'll notice, but the first thing I notice is I look at that point right there, and look, I get a particle going here and a particle going there, opposite directions. Opposite directions tell us different charges. One's positive, one's negative. But wait a second, it came from nowhere. That's kind of strange. It looks like we have two particles that emanate from nowhere. What else do we have that's nowhere? We have a photon. So if I have a photon, which doesn't exist when you stop it, right? It has no rest mass. It's sort of like a neutrino that way. It's neutral. But if I have a photon, and that photon can change into two particles, one matter and one antimatter, basically I have energy changing into mass equals mc squared. Right? I think, yeah, that's the equation right there. <laughs> equals mc squared. This is an image of proof that there is antimatter. Okay? That there are two particles being produced from what appears to be nothing. Photons are neutral, so they don't interact with the gas at all. Now, if you look at some of the rest of this stuff, you can see that there are lots of particles. This one actually looks like it separates into three parts. And there's lots of interesting data that you can get from just looking at this image. And it's kind of cool to do that. But are you satisfied with the model? Does this explain everything? Well, this picture explains matter and antimatter. We have electrons and positrons. We have probably protons. We won't be able to see neutrons or neutrinos here because they're neutral. So yeah, it explains a lot, but I'm not satisfied. I want to know what puts all this stuff in the way that it's put together and what holds it together. Okay? That's the one I wanted to show you. Quarks. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong quarks, oh, sorry. Does everyone know where he comes from, right? Anyone not know where he comes from? Deep Space Nine? <laughs> all right. <laughs> You should be thinking Big Bang Theory right now, okay? Quarks, let's look at quarks, because quarks explain a lot. They answer those questions that I just asked. We have the proton and the neutron, and I explained those already. We have the antiproton and the lambda particle. Now, when you think about what, what's happening among quarks, 
go back to quarks again. If you think what's happening among quarks, basically, if I put that proton next to another new proton, you would think that what would happen is they would be repelled. But what quarks may happen is instead they're attracted to one another as long as they're close to one another. If they get further away, then the quark interaction doesn't occur. Okay, so that's why quarks are important. And I've already explained everything interesting about quarks, except something that's really strange. Proton, what's charge as a proton? One positive charge, right? If it's made up of three quarks, what does that tell you about the charge on the quarks? Yeah, that means these are fractional charge. That's odd. There's another quantity called spin. We know that proton can have a spin up or a spin down. One unit is made up of three quarks. That means quarks must have fractional spin. This is completely different than anything that we had encountered before. Now remember, we've seen these things. We got our big enough gun where we could break protons and neutrons into their constituent quarks. Okay? Let's go back to leptons. Now I'm going to talk about this in detail because leptons and quarks are important. So uh, basically what leptons are, are the three particles that I mentioned, electrons, muons, and talons, and their constituent neutrinos. The electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Now, so that means if you have an interaction with an electron, that means that interaction, assuming it's the right kind, is going to generate an electron neutrino. This is the way the theory went on. And they saw that in the late 50s from an experiment. If you have an interaction with a muon, then what's going to happen is you're going to get a muon neutrino. And of course, with the tau particle, the same thing. Now, what happens in these interactions is that we have to conserve three different things. They're on the left-hand side over there. Well, three different things other than mass and charge. The electron number has to be conserved, the muon number, and the tau number. And this is always the case with particle physics. So if you like dealing with numbers, mostly whole numbers other than quarks, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is count. One, two, three, okay, I'm done. And that's pretty much how it goes. So muons then allow us to do the simple interaction here. It breaks into a muon neutrino, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. So wherever I have an electron, I have to have some type of electron neutrino. Wherever I have a muon, I have to have some sort of muon neutrino. Well, this is a great idea. And this is where Dr. Schwartz came in, and Dr. Letterman. Okay, what they did was they designed an experiment, a really cool experiment when you think about it. I, I believe it was Melvin Schwartz who was the first to say, I can build that. And what he said was, I can make a beam of neutrinos, something no one else had ever thought of before. And he says, I can take that beam of neutrinos, and I can focus it, and I can pick out the muon neutrinos. And I believe this is what his paper was about. So what they did was they put 13 and a half feet of steel between the source and the detector. They generated those neutrinos, those muon neutrinos, from pions and kaons. Pions decay into kaons, and kaons and stuff are floating around. You got to get rid of the pions and kaons those particles that you don't want. You only want neutrinos. So if you put a big enough piece of steel between you and the source, only the neutrinos will get through, because neutrinos basically go through the Earth. They go through anything, right? They don't interact. The pions and cans are caught inside the steel. Then what they did was they put up these aluminum detectors. And the neutrinos, some of them at least, would hit those detectors just right. And if they hit them just right, they would produce electrons. And then they would produce electron neutrinos, and there would be muons. That's the equation that's up there, these electron antineutrinos, sorry. And so if they tune it, I imagine turning a dial, what I think was probably a little bit more than that. They probably had to tune the detectors on a large scale. If they tuned it just right, they're going to be able to eliminate or separate the electron neutrinos from the muon neutrinos. And now they have a detector that says these are muon neutrinos. Remember, these were just theoretical particles at the time. They didn't know if this was going to work. This was, that's what's so great about science. Well, let's try it. That's sort of what the, the rule is, right? Um, I think this will work. 
And what they did, of course, they turned on the experiment, and I don't know how long it took, but I don't think it took very long because it was a clever idea. And what happened is they got the muon neutrinos. They showed that these muon neutrinos existed. And therefore, they're no longer theory, and that means the tau neutrino, which was also a theoretical particle at the time, was an obvious step. All they had to do was build a similar piece of apparatus, another group, and they ran through the same set of cycles. So this set up the experiment. It also set up the experiment for the quarks that were shown to exist, um, what was it, four years later. So it was a big experiment. This is an experimental image that sort of shows an experiment. What we have is we have an anti-proton -pro coming in, right down here, this P. And it's going to come in and it's going to hit a proton at rest. And when anti-proton and proton hit each other, they produce a whole lot of energy which come off as pions. Okay? That pion is going to come down here and it is going to basically decay into a neutrino, which you can't see, and the muon. What they were looking for is this product, this neutrino. If you have enough of these interactions occurring simultaneously, you get a beam of neutrinos. It's really clever. Okay? And the clever part is, where are you going to get the antiprotons? But that's a different story. You have to have a big interaction to generate those. Let's take another step back now. Now that we know all about leptons, let's go back to the quarks and talk about quarks and what they do to hold stuff together. Okay, let's think um, electron, proton. We know if I stick an electron and proton close enough together, they're going to be attracted to one another. How are they attracted? The electromagnetic force, right? What is the electromagnetic force? Exactly. Okay? <laughs> you don't know. And this is the cool part about particle physics. The electromagnetic force in particle physics is the exchange of particles. So basically, if I have an electron and a proton, and they're exchanging particles, whatever that particle is, that force carrier particle, in the right way, they'll be attracted. If I have two protons, and they're exchanging particles in the right way, photons are the particles, by the way, they'll be repelled. So a photon is a force charge, or a force carrier particle. And that exchange of photons determines whether something's going to be attracted or repelled, how much is going to be attracted to the other particle, how much is going to be repelled. Got it? Let's go to quarks. Remember, quarks make up matter. And what's the question we're trying to answer? What holds it all together? Why are we not being blown apart? Because we're made up of atoms which are positively charged, the nuclei are. Why don't they all repel each other and we're just this amorphous blob? Because of gluons. The quarks have these tiny little particles that they exchange called gluons. They are the force carrier for quarks, just like photons were the force carrier for electrons. Okay? Now, you put two quarks together, and if they get close enough, they're going to be stuck. And that force is very, very strong. So physicists, being very imaginative, call that the strong force. <laughs> right? And what happens to do that is they exchange gluons. The closer they are, the more rapidly these, these particles, these gluons, are being exchanged. The further they are, they're not being exchanged as rapidly. So if you orient your protons and your, your protons just right, so you get a down and an up close to one another, closer than the two ups, then it's going to be attractive. But if you get an up and an up close to one another, then they're not going to be attractive. Okay? Remember, they also have to overcome that fractional charge that we have. So gluons hold quarks together. Quarks make up protons and neutrons, thereby holding nuclei together, thereby allowing us to live and breathe. Okay? Well, let's think about this in a little bit. Now, you see this wonderful picture. It's colors. We like colors. <laughs> The, what they call these gluons are charge color carriers, okay, or color charge, color charge carriers, sorry. And what we know for all baryons, neutrons and protons, they have to be made up of charge carriers that are neutral in color, that result in neutral colors. So we have three gluons, or excuse me, three quarks making up a proton, and each of them has a different color, which is a property of a quark, and if you put them together to make a proton, 
It has no color whatsoever. If it has color, it's not matter. It's not stable matter. It's not a proton or a neutron. Okay? You're thinking, wait a second. Surely I can put two particles together. Well, how can you put two particles together with different colors and get something that is colorless? White. Okay? You can. You, well, you can for a little while. Mesons are made up of two quarks. You put them together, and then they annihilate each other. Because it's made up of a quark and an antiquark. And we know when we put matter and antimatter together, it produces energy. So we now can explain why the Earth holds together. It's really simple. So where do we stand? We have the weak force, which is this exchange of force carriers at the atomic level, these, this decay that I talked about. Those carriers, basically, are WZ particles. I'm not going to talk much about those. We have the photons for the electromagnetic and the gluons for the strong. And gravity, we don't know. Okay, There's something, high, there's a particle called the graviton, which may or may not exist. But it, in keeping with the same um, set of rules that we've developed for all other physics, particle physics, uh, gravity should have a carrier called the graviton, which ex is exchanged between massive objects, which allows it to be attracted to one another. Or repelled, if you're looking at the dark energy. Right. All right. Finally, this is what everyone's here for, right? The God particle, the Higgs boson. What does the Higgs boson do? Well, I gloss over this pretty quickly. I think you recognize the fact that I'm not talking at all in scientific terms. What I'm doing is I'm simply talking in general terms how these particles interact. But there's some problems with the particle theory. One of the problems that we have is all those force carrier particles have different masses. We have the photon, which has no rest mass. Okay, we have quarks, which are very, very tiny. And then we have the W and Z particles for the weak nuclear force, which are fairly large. And yet these particles, these force charge carriers, have exactly the same properties. They do exactly the same thing. How can that be? Okay. Well, to answer that question and to solve a little problem of mass conservation, which is always a problem, what they did was they hypothesized that there was another particle out there that when interacting with these force charge carriers, the photons and the quarks or the gluons, those two particles, the ones that were interested in this particular talk, there had to be some other particle that mediated, that allowed them to interact in the way they did so that they would have different properties depending on what they were doing. Okay, That's the Higgs boson. So they said, if this exists, it explains everything in the model that we have for particle physics, the standard model. And this is the experiment that they did last July. And you can see a little blip, which is near the energy of the Higgs boson, what they hypothesized. But it's not exactly it, but it's close enough. We'll say it's good. Okay, And it solves the problem of mass conservation, which we run into. The Higgs boson, maybe it can be best explained by that part too. We've discovered that nothingness is made of the Higgs boson. Um, the quote that I read, I think that explains it the best, is that it is, if you think of it as a field now, not a particle, it is a field that permeates all of the universe that interacts with all particles differently. So if it's a gluon, the field looks different. If it's a photon, the field looks different. And that allows the gluon and the photon then to do what they do, to allow charges to be attracted or repelled, to allow quarks to be attracted. Okay, It's kind of interesting. Now, the big question, what's the big question? The big question, is Max Born right? Is physics over now? We've found the last particle. Any questions? <laughs> Are we? No! Um, the Higgs boson introduces a problem with the inflationary model in the Big Bang. The, we have the Big Bang model which describes the universe. We put the inflationary model on top of that 
to try to fix some problems that we had, and now that they discover this particle, and they now know what the energy is, it makes the inflationary model, our fix to the Big Bang model, incorrect. And so, how do we solve this problem? Dave, we get a bigger gun. <laughs> we look for another particle. And maybe the gravitons will solve the problem. Don't know. Any other questions? Surely there must be questions. Yes? Going back a couple centuries, is there any analogy between the Higgs boson and the idea of the ether? I brought this up earlier when I got it. sounds exactly the same, doesn't it? The idea of the ether was that there was had to be some medium in which light traveled through. Because light possibly away couldn't possibly go through a vacuum. You know, light comes from other stars through a vacuum to Earth, but that's not what they thought around the turn of the, the 20th century. Okay? So ether was invented to allow waves light to move through it. So light would have something rigid to move along, but at the same time, planets and stars could move without being affected by this ether at all. It sounds a lot like the Higgs boson. The same idea. That it interacts differently with different materials. Yes? Does the Higgs boson have anything to do with like dark matter or like particles being equal to others, like that supersymmetry thing? Okay. Uh, if you believe in supersymmetry, then you can't believe in the Big Bang. Okay? If you believe in supersymmetry and believe in the Higgs boson, then you definitely don't believe in the Big Bang. <laughs> so the question is. We have something that now describes how, what matter is made out of completely and how it holds together. And then we have something that describes the origin of the universe, at least what we think is the origin of the universe. You put them together and they're now incompatible. And so, does it have something to do with supersymmetry? Yes. What it has to do with that, I have no idea. Supersymmetry is, is, is like string theory. It's a great theoretical model, but I don't know how we're ever going to test it. Yes? It was that bubble chamber that I showed. And it wasn't, didn't you see? And besides, gray is my favorite color. It's sort of how I feel all the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Let's think.